Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. Operational History The first liberators to see service were with the British, and they were the first to see just how versatile this airplane was. The RAF had a great need for air transport at this time, and the Liberator seemed ready-made for modification to do this kind of service. Later on, the U.S. would discover the same. The Brits brought their B-24s to Montreal, Canada for modification for logistic duties. The armament was removed and passenger seats and a cabin oxygen and heating system was added. These ships were used for Ferry Command's Atlantic Return Ferry Service, which flew civilian ferry pilots, who had delivered aircraft to the UK, safely back to North America so that they could pick up more planes to bring back to the war. Another job for the British Liberators was anti-submarine patrols with RAF Coastal Command in the Battle of the Atlantic. During the course of the war, Liberators were modified more and more in order to be more effective at hunting submarines. Later on, a version known as the Very Long Range or VLR Liberator had some armor and gun turrets stripped out to save weight so that they could carry extra gasoline in the Bombay tanks. These VLR Liberators were able to close the deadly mid-Atlantic gap where U-boats had been able to hunt without worry about danger from above. Not anymore. The VLR Liberators were able to look for subs with their ASV Mark II radar and hit them with rockets, machine gunfire, bombs, and depth charges. At night, the radar would show the VLR Liberator crew where the U-boat was at long range, and then they would switch on the so-called Lee light which was named after its inventor, Wing Commander Humphrey de Verde Lee. This was a two-foot-wide, powerful carbon arc searchlight, which would light up the sub so that the plane could sink it. As the war went on, Liberators flying with the Royal Canadian Air Force, the U.S. AAF's Anti-Submarine Command, and the U.S. Navy all joined the effort. Records disagree but somewhere between 70 to 90 U-boats were sunk specifically by Liberators. The U.S. AAF began receiving B-24s in mid-1941, and they began serving in every theater, including Africa, Europe, China, Burma, India, the Southwest Pacific, and the Pacific Theater. A B-24 was actually destroyed in Hawaii during the attack on Pearl Harbor, but it wasn't long before the B-24s were getting their revenge. Although there had been B-17s in the Pacific, soon the B-24s took over the heavy bombardment role because the B-24 was simply faster, had longer range, and could carry more bombs than the B-17. The B-24 was the main bomber of the U.S. Combined Bomber Offensive against Germany with nearly half of its heavy bomber force in the European theater of operations, and most of the Italian base force being made up of B-24s. Literally thousands of B-24s delivered hundreds of thousands of tons of high explosives and incendiary bombs on German military and industrial targets. Although the delivery of bombs to targets was the raison d'etre of the B-24, as stated before, its versatility just seemed boundless. The more you look, the more you find more examples of someone dreaming up another role for the B-24. One of them was assembly ships. You may have seen photos of these before and wondered what was going on with them. B-24s painted up in crazy patterns of stripes, checkers, or big polka dots to allow easy recognition. As the bomber formations got bigger and bigger, it became necessary to have a marker plane that everyone could recognize as belonging to one's group. So, war-weary B-24s were chosen and marked up in the crazy, brightly painted patterns. These ships also featured flashing lights and flare guns mounted on the fuselage, all to increase their visibility. These ships were not armed, and were manned by just a skeleton crew, 
as they would not continue on into combat. Another name for the assembly plane was Judas Goat, which I've just learned myself means, in the world of herding animals, refers to an animal that is specifically trained to lead the herd right into the slaughterhouse, whereby the Judas Goat would be spared and able to do the job again, while all of his buddy goats got their throats cut. <laughs> wow, that got dark quickly. We've already mentioned that the Brits used some of their liberators for transports. In early 1942, the USA's need for long-range air transport was so great and so lacking that some B-24Ds began being diverted from the production line for conversion to transports. And later, the dedicated C-87 Liberator Express was built concurrently in Consolidated's plant in Fort Worth, Texas. C-47s didn't have the characteristic glazed nose of the B-24. This was replaced by a hinged metal door cap to allow loading cargo into the nose compartment. A cargo door was fitted to the left side of the fuselage. Windows were added along the sides of the fuselage also. The C-87 could carry between 20 and 25 passengers or 12,000 pounds of cargo. 287 of this type were built. Another thing that needed to be transported was aviation gasoline. During the time that B-29 bombers were operating out of China, vast amounts of fuel had to be flown in over the Himalayas, and again, B-24s got the nod to do the job. Unlike the C-87s, these fuel transports were conversions of existing B-24 bombers that had their armament and bombing gear removed, including the turrets being fared over with sheet metal. Eight large fuel tanks were installed that could carry 2,900 gallons of aviation gasoline, and this type was named the C-109. I cannot report that they were very popular with their crews. They were very difficult to land when fully loaded, especially at airfields that were at higher elevations. Nevertheless, these C-109s were operated by the 20th Air Force in the China-Burma-India Theater in order to support the B-29s in China. Originally, the plan was to convert up to 2,000 of these flying gas trucks in order to be able to support the growing operations out of China. But these orders were all cancelled when the superfortresses were moved to the Marianas, where they could more easily get fuel by sea. In the end, 218 C-109s were converted. Some of these tankers ended up with the 9th Troop Carrier Command in Europe, where they helped transport gasoline to the advancing ground and air forces after the Normandy invasion. One place where you wouldn't expect to find B-24s operating was at low altitude at night, right? Well, that's where the B-24Ds of Operation Carpetbagger flew. The ongoing mission of the Carpetbaggers was to supply weapons and other cargo to the resistance in Italy, France, and the Low Countries. Starting in 1944, these liberators were modified by taking out the belly turret and most of the other guns, except leaving the rear turret for protection from night fighters attacking from the rear. The oxygen equipment was pulled out too. They would not need it at treetop level. The carpetbaggers were then painted with a special black anti-searchlight paint. The pilots and crews of these missions had to be highly skilled as well as having balls of steel. Although the night flight above the English Channel would be done at a reasonable 6,000 feet, once they were over France, the pilot would nose the Liberator down to 500 feet above the ground, navigating by moonlit features on the ground such as roads, railway tracks, rivers, lakes, and towns. As they got close to their objective, the crew would start scanning the ground for the flashlights marking their drop zone. Once they found it, secret agents and supplies were dropped by parachute through the belly turret opening. B-24s that were used by the U.S. Navy were known as PB-4Y-1s. In most of these, the belly turret was replaced by a radome, and most of them had the distinctive Urco-style 
turret in the nose. Later on, it was decided that a purely naval version of the B-24 would make sense, and it was then that the lesson of the experimental XB-24K with the single finned tail was remembered. In order to get better directional stability, the new naval aircraft would have the single tail. Defensive armament was upped to have 12 50 cal machine guns in two dorsal turret, two waist turrets, and in the nose and tail. There was no belly gun. Superchargers were omitted, as maritime patrol missions were usually flown at lower altitudes. The new aircraft was known as the PB-4Y2 Privateer, and 739 of these were built. They served until the late 50s. Pilots because so many of them were built, a lot of people flew B-24s, some of whom were or became famous. I've already mentioned Joseph B. Kennedy Jr., who flew and died in a B-24. Robert Altman, the director, flew B-24s in the Pacific. George McGovern, the senator and U.S. presidential candidate in 1972, was a B-24 pilot based out of Italy. If you'd like to read a fascinating book about his wartime experiences, Stephen Ambrose's The Wild Blue is recommended reading. Speaking of reading, one of my favorite books about flying, Fate is the Hunter, was written by Ernest K. Gahn. He was a pioneering airline pilot who flew the C-87 Cargo Express aircraft all over the world, including over the hump in southern Asia and China. Although the writing can be a little overly flowery, Gan does not sugarcoat the flying life of those days, nor does he express much affection for the C-87 Cargo Express. He wrote, quote, They were an evil bastard contraption, nothing like the relatively efficient B-24 except in appearance. Close quotes. He vividly described many hair-raising exploits flying these beasts, including almost crashing an overloaded C-87 into the famous Taj Mahal in India. Perhaps the most famous pilot to fly the B-24 was the actor Jimmy Stewart. He was credited with flying more than 20 combat missions as a pilot and also flew many more uncredited missions filling in for other pilots as needed. He entered the air service as a private and rose to the rank of colonel and had to actively fight being offered cushy jobs because of his movie star status. His devotion to duty was such that he had to actually be temporarily grounded by his superiors after one particularly hairy mission when a German 88 shell went right through his B-24 blasting a hole through the cockpit and almost throwing him out of his seat. He and his fellow pilot were able to look down through the two foot wide hole in the aircraft inches from his boot and straight into the German landscape below. But despite the minus 40 degree winds blowing through the stricken aircraft, Stuart brought the bomber back, even as the broken aircraft was gradually ripping itself apart in the strain of maintaining flight and losing two engines along the way. Although Stuart wanted to fly again right after, he was told that he needed a break, and he was grounded for a couple of weeks to recoup. I'll include a picture of Stuart before and after his combat tour. You'll see that the effects are pretty shocking of what uh, command and flying in combat will do to a man. You may never have heard of B-24 pilot Robert Sternfels, but you probably have seen a picture of his airplane. It is one of those iconic photographs of the war, right up there with the crying Frenchmen after the fall of France, the empty landing craft and the guys waiting ashore on D-Day, and the Soviet and American flags going up on the Reichstag and Iwo Jima, respectively. I'm pretty sure you've seen it. It's of a B-24 banking slightly, flying insanely low over a flaming and smoking oil refinery. 
The aircraft is so low and the image is in such focus that the picture looks staged or photoshopped. But for the most part, it isn't. The airplane in the image is Sternfels B-24 called the Sandman and the place being bombed is Ploesti, Romania. One of the strategic targets that air planners wanted to disrupt was Axis oil production. Without a supply of oil, the tanks, ships, and yes, aircraft of Nazi Germany would cease to become a factor in the war. Romania was a major oil producer for the Reich, and the Ploesti oil refineries themselves provided about 30% of all Axis oil production. Imagine what it would do if you could knock out those facilities. Well, in August 1943, that's what Operation Tidal Wave was supposed to do. It wasn't the first time that B-24s had visited Ploesti. In June 1942, 13 Liberators had hit the refineries. Damage had been small to the refineries, and both sides came away learning lessons that would set the stage for Tidal Wave. The Americans saw that the target was surprisingly lightly defended and decided that Ploesti needed a return visit with many, many more B-24s to finish the job. They assembled a formidable task force of 178 B-24s in the Libyan desert near Benghazi, including five bomb groups, two from the 9th Air Force and three from the 8th. Due to the previously mentioned light defenses of Ploesti, it was decided to attack during the day. They would rely on the element of surprise flying low to avoid radar and maintaining strict radio silence. The five groups trained extensively in the desert, flying low to attack mock-up models of the refineries. It was hoped that the B-24s would appear out of nowhere and that the refineries would be in flames before the German and their Romanian allies knew what hit them. I had said that both sides had learned lessons from the early raid. The Germans decided that Ploesti needed a lot more defense, and so added hundreds of 88mm guns and 10.5cm flak anti-aircraft guns, as well as scores of lighter AA guns. These guns were cleverly concealed in fake buildings, on railway cars, and even haystacks. They had 50-odd fighters, including BF-109s and BF-110s within range of Ploesti. It has been estimated that Ploesti was the third most heavily defended target in the Greater Reich, and the most defended target outside of Germany the elements were all in place for a clash of titans. Robert Sternfels was one of the pilots tasked to fly the mission. He survived the ordeal and the war, and in 2010, he was filmed giving a presentation about his experiences. On this video, an older, but still very with it, Sternfels sits in front of a bust wearing his USAAF uniform and several easels holding maps and photographs. It looks like a school presentation, except instead of a couple of teenagers reading off of cue cards, it's an older gentleman in a suit and tie who always seems to be smiling as he tells his story. In fact, let's let him tell his story starting with the reason why Ploesti was such an important target. And that's how important it was. The very first raid in Europe was the Ploesti oil fields. Now, why was the oil field so important? Because Germany doesn't, doesn't have oil, so they had to make the oil from, or make the gas or the oil from coal. Well, that system, called the Fischer something else, is a very, very, uh, vi viable, viable system, but it's a very costly system. But Germany, that's the only, the only way that they, they could feed the, re, uh, the, the uh, gasoline engines and also the diesel engines. They made their, made their oil from coal. But the other thing was is that they couldn't use that gasoline that they made because the gasoline wasn't a high enough octane. 
It is today. They have different systems today, but uh, then you couldn't use it. So he had to get a regular natural crude oil, and the only way he got that was from Poesti, Romania. So that target was very, very important to Hitler, and they decided that that would be the number one target of all the, all the uh, raids that they were making at that time. So, to destroy this vitally important target, the Americans assembled 178 B-24s and 1,751 aircrew to the airfields near Benghazi, Libya. One of them was Sternfels in his plane, the Sandman, and getting to North Africa had been an adventure in itself. And I picked it up in Topeka, Kansas in 1943, and uh, when I was uh, uh, 22 years old and had these nine guys with me, and uh, the first time that the, uh, the uh, sergeant, you know, he, he, he was bored with what he was doing, and he says, yeah, you can get the plane, take this one. He said, uh, it's on the, on the flight line, go out there and see if it's okay. So I, we took our crew and we went out to see the plane. And uh, so I said, well, first thing we got to do is see if it flies. So we, we all got in it and we started it up and I checked the mags and boy, it, one, one mag just wasn't working just right. But anyway, we tried to clear it out. We thought maybe it was, you know, oil that had accumulated on the spark plugs. We finally got it running right. And we took it off, and sure enough, the tachometer started to do f fancy things, and so I, I feathered it and came around and, and landed. And then uh, I pulled it up to the place again, and we tried it again, and it looked fine. I mean, it checked out fine on the ground. I took off again, and sure enough, the same thing happened. Well, this time I called the crew chief, and uh, I said, come on out here and tell me what's wrong with this thing. So he came out and, you know, being a second lieutenant, it is tough because you're right at the very bottom of everything. And the master sergeant, you know, knows more than you do. So, so anyway, he, he came out and he says, he checked it out. He said, there's nothing wrong with this thing. And I said, Sergeant, I said, you're going to go with me on a trip right now. And he says, okay. So he went on the trip. We got down and he says, It'll take two days to replace the engine. So, <laughs> but anyway, that, that baby I took all the way from Topeka, Kansas, through South America, and uh, over to uh, uh, Cairo, Egypt, and then to Libya. Uh, and it took a month to get there. So, Any other questions? The question was, how did we name the airplane? Well, I had nothing to do with it. I, they said, uh, I said, crew, what do you want to call it? And they said, well, we'll call it the Sandman. And we were on the desert with all the sand and everything. But I thought that it had some connection with the song, Sandman, you know. But th the song came in later. It had nothing to do with it. See? So anyway, uh, the only thing that I contributed to it is that I drew the name Sandman. And uh, they, somebody painted it on the airplane. But those little ducks that are on the bottom, they were going to represent each mission, but they got to the point where the ground crew said, oh, hell, we're running out of space, forget it. We'll just <laughs> it. But that airplane made 48 missions before it was shot down. It was a good airplane. And we used to, you know, the sand on the desert uh, was very, very fine. I mean, it, wasn't, it wasn't like you see out here in the, in the, in the uh, uh, shoreline. But it's very, very fine. It's, only, it's like face powder, even finer than face powder. And that would get into everything. And, and instead of getting, say, 1,000 hours on our engines, if we got 500 or 250, we were doing good. You know, the reason for that is that you could always tell how much gas you were using, but you couldn't tell how much oil you were using. So once they had the aircraft and the crews assembled... The battle plan was to cross the Mediterranean and the Adriatic Sea, pass near the island of Corfu, cross over the Pindus Mountains in Albania, cross southern Yugoslavia, enter southwestern Romania, and then turn east toward Ploesti. The plan was to fly low, 
and the crews were not used to this kind of flying, so plenty of special training and practice would be needed. And I didn't know where, honestly, where Romania was, even though I was in, in North Africa, until they started to tell us where we were going to go. They, were going to, they started to tell us where we were going to go about the middle of July of 1943. And at that time, they said, we're going to make a raid, and it's going to be a long one. And he said, instead of flying at 25,000 or 22,000 or 27,000 or 28,000, we're going to fly at low level. So one guy raised his hands and he said, how low? Now, don't forget we were on the desert, and uh, we were out in the open. We didn't have a facility like this to have a briefing. And there were camels and camel riders all around us and everything else. Everybody trusted everybody else, I guess. But anyway, they said, you can fly as low as you want to, but don't hit the camels because we don't know where to get them. <laughs> See? But one guy did actually, uh, apparently, got too close to a camel. But anyway, we practiced low-level flying on the desert. Now, you pilots that uh, have flown uh, on the, next to the ground in hot days, you, realize, you all know that the, 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 it's just rough as a cob. You bounce all over the place. Well, that's exactly what we did when we were practicing. Another factor and challenge for low-level flying was simply the flying characteristics of the B-24. The B-24 uh, took a lot more muscle to fly it. And uh, it reminded me of uh, one of the Fords that I had one time going down the freeway. You, you just couldn't keep that thing going straight unless you, unless you steered it every minute. Well, the B-24 was like that. Do you know the words that they use, fly by wire? Hell, we invented that one because that's all we had was that our controls were directly connected to the ailerons and to the rudders. And if you have a big airplane, it's like a big truck without uh, power steering or power brakes. You just got to muscle it. And I had real big muscles at that time, <laughs> plus the fact that I had calluses all over my hand like this at this point. And that was due to the fact that we had a control wheel that had two horns on it that stuck up. And you had to grab that and then grab the, the, uh, uh, the throttles as you were flying formation. And so you had to move this back and forth. Well, they used uh, uh, a real, real small, about this small, wheel. And uh, it's hard to grab that real tight. So I took, I took rope and I roped it. And of course, that made it very rough on your hand. But it was a uh, much harder airplane to fly straight and level than the B-17, because the B-17, the parts, were taken from the Stratocruiser, which was developed back in 1935, 1936. And they used the, the uh, wings of the Stratocruiser for the B-17. And all they did was make a new fuselage and do all the other things that were necessary. But you're right, it was a much harder plane to fly. It takes a real man to fly it, yes. <laughs> Not only did the pilots need training, the B-24s were especially modified for the mission. They took out the uh, Norton bomb sites. Uh, they were worthless for that mission. And, uh, oh, the bombs? Uh, not as far as I know, they didn't modify them. The only thing is that, is that you know how a bomb works. They, they have a propeller on it, and it spins, and they can program that. And that, what that does is release acid. And if, it's, if you want it for a long time, why well, they can program it so the propeller would have to go a long, a long time before it punctured the uh, place where the acid was. And if you had... Uh, if you wanted to have the bomb go off instantly, why then you'd program it another way. But these were programmed so that the bombs would go off after we left the area, the last person left the area. 
So after all the work of assembling the men and the machines and all the planning and the training was done, there was nothing left to do but to actually take off and fly the mission. On the morning of the 1st of August, 1943, the five groups took off. Vast amounts of dust during the takeoffs strained their already overburdened engines, which were attempting to haul the burden of large bomb loads and extra fuel into the air. One aircraft was lost during the takeoff, meaning that 177 aircraft headed out north over the Mediterranean. This is a Poesti route map and also some history about the number of airplanes that took off as well as those that returned and uh, 54 were shot down. Well, the route that we took actually started here at Benghazi, Libya. And uh, we flew almost north until we came to the island of Corfu. And, and at the island of Corfu, we made a turn and at that time, we were at 9,000 feet. But going to the island of Corfu, why, we were somewhere around 4,000 feet, but that was all. We did see a submarine that was uh, uh, charging their batteries somewhere along this route. So they probably did uh, uh, radio to their headquarters that we were on our way. But in Corfu, I'm sure, since it was a German-occupied island, I'm sure that they had spotters there. And so they reported it. Because when we got into Poesti, that train that we encountered could not have been exactly where it was unless they had previous uh, information about how we were going to go there or what our speed was. And the reason that we were 9,000 feet in Corfu was that because along this Albanian course, uh, co coast, there are high mountains. Now, when we, when we saw these mountains, they were covered with uh, clouds. Now, when you have a hundred and some odd airplanes, 110 airplanes behind you, the leader has a real difficult uh, situation. And how to get 110 airplanes, let's say, over the mountains in the weather without everybody running into each other. Well, we were in what they call loose formation, which uh, if you see air shows, you'll see that they're right next to each other and so forth. The planes are, are in perfect f formation. Well, we, when you're in a mission like that and you have so many hours of flying, you can't fly like that because it's too, too much, it's too fatiguing. So we, had, we were spread out. So when he encountered the, the problem of how to get these airplanes through this weather, all we did was get up high enough so that we would not hit the mountains. And we went through almost in loose formation. And if you think about it, close your eyes sometime on the freeway and keep going and hoping that nobody changes position. And that's the way that we felt going through that those clouds. And they, fortunately, they weren't very thick and in about a minute or a minute and a half or two minutes, why we broke out on the other side. But nevertheless, that's, that is what, what we encountered. Then after we did that, we started to let down. And we were about 3,000 or 4,000 feet going over uh, Albania, I mean, after Albania into Bulgaria. That's, that was very beautiful because everything was farmland and nice and green and everything else in, in contrast to what we had been seeing over the desert. Why, it was just like a, a Sunday ride in the country. And uh, I was just thinking about that same thing. I said, oh, isn't this gorgeous, you know, not thinking about what was going to happen. So we finally got into Bulgaria and into Romania, and nothing happened when we got there except when we hit the town of Foest. And then things started to go wrong. Seriously wrong. The leader of the group that Sternfels and the Sandman were in made a wrong turn. He was navigating. Compton was navigating. And I talked with his, his uh, uh, navigator later, and the navigator says, I wasn't navigating. And, and that's all he said. 
and it was Compton that was navigating, so he, he turned at the wrong place. And when he did that, it screwed up that whole mission. But all he had to do, if you go off, off, your, off your heading, what do you do? You turn back on your heading, don't you? Well, the same, that's what he should have done. And all that was around there were cornfields. There wasn't anybody shooting at us. We didn't get shot at until we turned on that uh, 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 down from the IP down, and then we got shot at. We went to a place called Foleste, F-L-O-E-S-T-I, and it's about 12 miles north of Poesti. And at that particular place, we were to make a right turn and go down the railroad track to this Astro Romano refinery that they showed you on the movie. And the reason for that is that they were the lar that was the largest refinery that they had in Poesti. And we had more airplanes in behind us, and, that's, and we were supposed to hit that particular target. When we made that turn, and uh, we were in trail, because, you know, with these heavy airplanes, you can't just turn like that, like, like Joe here can do it with a P-38. He can stand it on the wings, see? I, you can't do that. So, and we were only about 200 feet, and our wingspan on one side was 55 feet. So that made us very close to the top of the, of the, of the trees. So anyway, we were going around very slowly, and we got into trail, and there was a railroad track right next to us. It wasn't any further away than that wall over there. And on that railroad track was a train, a steam train, and I know it was steam because the, the smoke coming out of the stack was black and it was laying right down on top of the, of the cab. And when that occurs, you know damn well he's going fast. And well, behind that train were about 15 flat cars. And on the flat cars were guns. And so when we went, we were parallel with them, or they were parallel with us, at the same time that we made our turn, and I felt like we were ducks in a shooting gallery because they were shooting down. We lost 22 airplanes between the time we turned and the target. And we had 48 airplanes to start with. And I, I was just lucky. I didn't get a, I got holes in the airplane, but I didn't, nobody was hurt. And I, I went through all this other monkey business and, uh, uh, was just lucky, but that train was in the right place at the right time to intercept us. Was that an accident? No way. We ran into an ambush, and that was all there was to it. Because on the, well, as we went down this, uh, uh, our route, we had, we had uh, haystacks on either side. And the top of the haystacks would open up, and here they exposed a bunch of guns. Well, they were waiting for us, and that's all there was to it. It just wasn't supposed to be this way. There had been a very detailed plan to hit specific targets. Every one of the 178 uh, bombardiers had a specific target. And just dropping bombs on, on the, uh, on the uh, storage tanks didn't do any good because you can, you, can, you, know, you can rebuild those in a hurry. But what you need to do is bomb the most important parts of the refinery, and that would be the powerhouses and, uh, let's say, other things that were important. Well, the Germans were smart enough to build concussion walls around those most important parts of the refinery. And the idea was, if we could see the ground, the, the bombardier was supposed to drop the bomb inside of those concussion walls. Well, when you can't see the ground, well, what the hell? But when Sternfels and the Sandman arrived over the target, the exquisite plan to precisely attack the refineries and drop their bombs right into those concussion walls was all messed up. Well, I'll let him explain it. That all went down the tubes when uh, uh, Colonel uh, uh, Keith Compton, K.K. Compton, turned at the wrong place. 
And he, he destroyed that whole plan. And uh, because the other airplanes hit the target that we were supposed to hit and hit other targets too. And they were on fire when we got there. And uh, we thought by, before we arrived there, we thought by looking down, we could see where, where the fire was. And we thought that maybe the Germans had these smoke pots out so that they were blowing the smoke over the target. But that ain't the way it was. It was that the other people had bombed our target, so some of the bombs were even going off. Frankly, I did not see the ground. And I was 150 or 200 feet above the ground. I didn't see it. And because it was all on fire. And I asked my bombardier, I said, Where did, when did you drop the bombs? Or how did you know when to drop it? He says, I couldn't see the ground. He says, all I did was drop it when there was fire underneath us. And he dropped them. So after the AA gun ambush and the hell of flying over the flaming refineries and the attacking 109s and 110s, there was still the ordeal of getting home. And uh, then after we, we hit Poesti, why I joined up with the leader of the group and then uh, he had three engines running so I had to slow down. I had to drop gear and also drop flaps in order to not overrun them. And, I, and we were only up about 500 feet or less. And we turned around and we made it back and he decided to fly right over Turkey, which we did. And uh, it took us a long time because he had three engines running. And the problem there that you have is that you, you have to use all the power you got in order to climb with three engines. And uh, he threw out everything in the airplane, everything, he, the, the bottles, the, the uh, the oxygen bottles, and uh, they chopped them all out. They chopped everything out of the airplane they could do it. And I was on his wing, and I saw this stuff coming out of the airplane, and I backed off and uh, let this junk fall down. And then uh, when we arrived at Cyprus, Cyprus was dark. It wasn't, nobody, I mean, not a, not a bit of light. And finally, was the lead plane uh, 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 sent out the, uh, the, the code of the day and when that happened why we got a light and the runway lit up. Well I was flying downwind and I was number two to land or number three to land and the first guy to land of course was the, was the colonel and as I was going downwind and I hadn't turned on the, on the base leg why, all of a sudden, why I saw these sparks on the, uh, of, from the airplane. And I thought, holy God, he's, he's crashed. Well, that's what, what happened. He crashed on landing. So the problem was that we were out 14 hours and we didn't know how much, how much uh, oil we had. We had a lot of gas. But we didn't know how much we could re we could measure gas, but we can't measure oil, and these engines burn a lot of oil, and so I didn't know what we were going to do right at that moment, whether to fly around over the over the field and and parachute out, or uh, take a chance and try to get down here to Palestine, and that was that's over water, and these airplanes are not good on ditching. In fact. Uh, uh, it's suicide to try to ditch one of them. So before I had to make the final decision why another runway lit up and we landed in Cyprus. The raid had been a disaster. 53 B-24s were destroyed by accidents, AA, fighter attack, and unknown reasons. 310 airmen lost their lives and 190 were captured and became POWs. And Sturfels wasn't even back to his home base yet. He was still in Cyprus. And on the flight back to Libya, the bad luck of Ploesti nearly got him again. Just as they were getting ready to land, they flew into a storm in the desert. Well, when we got to Benghazi, you know, after going through all that we went through, I was on the final 
and just about ready to to uh, land, you know, and I couldn't see a damn thing. We don't have any windshield wipers on our airplanes, and I couldn't see out front. I couldn't see whether, you know, I, I was in a position with the nose up and ready to set it down. And so I opened up the side window and looked sideways and landed the airplane in Benghazi. <laughs> and it wasn't a bad landing, you know, acceptable, I'm here today. <laughs> And finally, there's the story of the picture, the one that I told you about at the start of Sternfeld's tale, and of which I will post on the Facebook page. On the video, Sternfeld sits in front of an easel supporting the image. We see the B-24 flying over the flaming and smoking refinery, banking to our right with some smokestacks to the left. Also, Sternfeld's holds up a diagram of how the camera had been mounted in the tail of his aircraft. I think the f most famous picture of World War II uh, is showing this airplane over the burning refineries at Poesti, Romania. And uh, I was the pilot of that plane. And uh, it, was, it was the interesting thing is, is that how it was taken. Well, these... Uh, these cameras that they had in some of the airplanes were mounted at the rear of the B-24s. And they had the cameras inside, and there's a hole right at, or a, 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 uh, an opening right at this place in all these B-24s. And it was designed to mount a camera so that it could take pictures straight down. But they moved the camera on an angle and they put outside a mirror. When they took a picture of the mirror, of course the image is reversed. So many times you will see the picture like this. This was a magazine, or rather a newspaper. It's, it wasn't this color, it has aged. But it's the uh, paper that was published in, in uh, uh, Palestine when I was over there and the dates on it and everything. But you'll find that the picture looks like this. And this is not the way it happened. This is only because the mirror was reflecting this image and they were taking a picture of the mirror. Sternfels holds up a magazine cover with the B-24, this time banking to our left with the smokestacks to our right, which is the mirror flipped image of what actually happened. The problem for historians is that the National Archives have the wrong image, and so whenever there are requests for it, the wrong one goes out. However, Sternfels explains that for a National Geographic special about the famous raid, he made sure that they got it right. That the uh, archives send it out. They send it out like this. Well, being the pilot of that plane, I should know which way the smokestacks were. And uh, so anyway, I got an email just this morning from the editor, or rather the, the owner of the uh, company that did this uh, documentary and also did this, uh, that uh, we won the war over Poesti. In other words, they're going to publish it like this as it should be instead of the way that it came from the archives. So although Sternfels won the war over the picture of Ploesti, the raid itself was a failure. Although an estimated 40% of the refining capacity at the Ploesti refineries was reduced, some refinery machinery was left untouched and most of the damage was repaired in weeks. And after that, the net output of fuel was even greater than before the raid, as the refinery hadn't even been operating at maximum capacity before the raid. For that, 53 B-24s were destroyed, 310 airmen died, and 190 were captured. Proportionally, it was the most costly major Allied air raid of the war. Five medals of honor and 56 distinguished service crosses were earned on that day. Although the B-24 named Sandman was lost in a later raid by another crew, Sternfels survived the war, was highly decorated, and achieved the rank of Major. 
He died peacefully in his sleep at the ripe age of 97 on January 24, 2018. If you'd like to see the video from which the previous audio clips were obtained, please look up the Ploesti Raid on YouTube by Peninsula Seniors Videos. Survivors If you add up the numbers of B-24s, the naval PB-4Y, the export LB-30, and all the other variants, experiments, and misfits, you end up with somewhere around 19,000 aircraft built. Then when you find out that only 13 exist today, it's pretty shocking. Only two of those are airworthy. One of them is the B-24J with the serial number 44-44052. This liberator, known as Witchcraft, was restored and is maintained in airworthy condition by the Collings Foundation of Stowe, Maryland. Witchcraft flew with the 467th Bomb Group, 790 Bomb Squadron, and was truly one of the lucky ones to survive 130 combat missions. And, perhaps more importantly, survive the wrecking crew at the end of World War II. Liberator B-24L, serial number 44-50186, was built by Ford at the Willow Run factory and was delivered to the RAF in 1944. It was operated by the RAF in India and then abandoned there. However, was fixed up to serve in the Indian Air Force in 1949. In 1968, it was swapped for a Lysander from the Canadian National Air Museum and arrived in Canada June 1968. It presently wears a livery of RCAF Eastern Air Command. I knew from the very beginning that the B-24 was not going to fit into one or even maybe two episodes, and it has taken forever to get to this level of completion, and at some point I know that I just have to push the button and publish the beast. On the other hand, there's so much more to share. There are two B-24 crash sites within a day trip's range of my home base, and I really want to visit those and share their stories with you. Also, whenever I get back to the museum in Ottawa, I want to visit their B-24, which is tucked away in the back hangar. Lastly, if you want to hear more about B-24s and privateers right now, I would invite you to check out another podcast, Warbirds, Tales from Above. There you can find a couple of great episodes on those very topics. There are plenty of pictures of what has been described today on the World of Warbirds Facebook page, and if you like what you've heard today, give us a good review and share with your friends. Thanks. World of Warbirds is researched, written, and recorded by me, Ryan Pierce. The music is the Royal Canadian Air Force March Past. Thanks for listening. Thank you.